When externally inflicted pain happens to us, an injury, a setback, a rejection, a failure, a breakup, loss of a job, financial hardship, or whatever it is, it hurts. But what we do with that pain is very important. If we hang on to it, play the victim and enter into a state of internal suffering, it starts to define our identity. We wallow in the land of regret and sabotage our potential. In today's episode, I will explain the two reasons why humans have a negative tendency to turn external pain into internal suffering. And most importantly, I'm gonna share with you the antidote to self-sabotage and teach you the one technique that prevents you from slipping into that negative state again. I'm Sam McCool, and welcome to A Higher Branch. Hello and welcome. If you are new to our podcast, I hope you enjoy today's episode and lots of future episodes that I have coming up. So please don't miss a thing by subscribing. And if you like this episode at the end, please leave a comment, give me a rating and review and share it with your friends because I'm on a mission to improve people's lives and I can't do it without you. And I want you to come along with me on this journey and help me share the message. Today, I'm going to talk about a topic that most people feel uncomfortable about because it is self-inflicted. Pain is usually something that happens to us externally. It's forced on us. And it can be an injury or a sickness in relationships. It can be a breakup or an argument or death of a family member or losing a job or losing a friend or losing money going into bankruptcy, pain is inevitable. It happens to all of us. And the difference really between people who are successful in life and people who struggle is that people who are successful deal with the pain and setbacks and continue going after their goals. Whereas people who let the pain stop their progress indulge in internal suffering long after the pain has left. In other words, they ruminate and they wallow in that pain. So, Pain is acute. It's external. It should be short-lived. Suffering is chronic self-inflicted and becomes a long-term part of our identity. So we get stuck in the past, living what I call in the land of regret. And what is suffering really? When you look at it, uh, at its most fundamental level, suffering is resistance. It's blame. It's control. It's resentment of the past. And it's us resisting the pain and not accepting it. So I mentioned a few examples uh, of pain, like injury, breakup, death of a loved one. Let's look at how a, person's, a person evolves from that pain into that suffering when, when they don't know how to process that pain. So sickness or injury, injury, for example, turns into suffering because we stop exercising. I know when I suffered injuries over the years, I lived in a land of regret for a while until I used the techniques that I'm going to share with you later that helped me get out of that state to actually move on and rebuild and rehab and get back to the gym. Uh, the same with relationships. If you've experienced a breakup, a breakup is painful, but you turn it into suffering by not going out anymore, not pursuing new relationships, maybe even staying in a relationship with, which is built on arguments and systemic arguments and the continuous pain of that argument. So suffering is continuing to live in that toxic relationship and not moving on. When it comes to your family, arguing with one of your family members, either your kids or your brothers or sisters, uncles, aunts, Whoever it is, that's painful, having an argument with a close family member. And the closer they are, the more painful it is. But when you stop talking, communicating, apologizing, hugging, and giving and give them the silent treatment, that's long-term suffering, where suddenly there's a delta between you both. And I know some family members who haven't spoken for years because they're hanging on to that suffering. What about the death of a loved one? Now, I experienced that myself when, my, when I lost my father a few years ago, and it was very painful in the short term, but I did not let that turn into suffering because I started living the life I knew he wanted me uh, to live. I wanted to honor his beautiful qualities by emulating them. For example, his strong work ethic still lives in me. So I did not let that pain paralyze me in, uh, from moving forward in life. What about losing a job? 
people who lose a job, sure, that's painful in the short term. It dents your confidence. Uh, you know, I lost <laughs> quite a few jobs early in my career, but you don't want that to turn into long-term suffering by not getting another job or by turning up at an interview for your next job and hating on your whole job. I've seen people do that in interviews and I sit there and I can tell they're hanging on to the suffering of losing their old job. What about losing a friend? That's painful in the short term, but don't turn it into suffering in the long term by holding on to grudges or gossiping about them. Now, what about losing money or going bankrupt? Of course, that's painful in the short term and it's part of life. If you are not suffering pain, you're not doing life. You are living in a comfort zone. You, li you are living in your shell. You are not moving forward. You're not s sticking your neck out and, and showing courage, just like the turtle, right? The turtle has to stick its neck, neck out to move forward. And in doing so, it exposes itself to predators because in its shell, it's impenetrable. You know, with this last example about losing money, it reminds me... Uh, of a friend of mine who lost, and this is 15 years ago, who lost $1.8 million of very hard earned savings. And this guy saved many, many years and he invested it with another friend and ended up losing it all. Now I can tell you the suffering that went on with my friend was unbearable to witness because every time I saw him, that's all he talked about for many weeks, many months. In fact, Two to three years later, he was still talking about it, how he lost his money, how he was bitter about it. He was resisting it. He was blaming. He was regretting. And sadly, this person lost a lot more money in the future because his whole focus was about the suffering. His pain turned into internal suffering. And regrettably, he also lost his marriage. And it was difficult to witness. Now, that's a confronting cautionary tale because it was self-inflicted. He could have chosen a different path to overcoming the pain, a technique that I will share with you later. But for now, I want to give you the reasons why humans have a tendency to turn external pain into prolonged internal suffering. And I've witnessed so many brilliant people, their whole lives either stall or come falling into a heap or they become self-destructive because they cling to the identity of suffering. They keep suffering the pain of the past and living in the land of regret. So, okay, what are the reasons why humans have a tendency to cling to suffering? Why is that a default setting for some people? And I want to share these with you because I don't want you to dump on yourself because you're probably listening to this thinking, yeah, I do that, but there's a reason for it. It is so easy when you're suffering pain externally even through an accident, for you to turn it into a chronic self-inflicted suffering. The suffering continues in your mind long after the pain has left your body. So why? Why do we have that propensity as humans to cling to suffering? Well, this is the confronting part of this conversation. And I share these two reasons with you with the utmost of love and respect because I too have fallen into this trap and sabotaged my progress. So I'm not sharing anything with you that I haven't confront, uh, confronted within myself, right? So he goes, the truth is we cling to suffering either one, because we want attention from the people in our lives, the people we love, or two, it's our excuse to do nothing in life. So I'm going to address the second one first because that is really the one that is most common. Uh, you know, when people are suffering from something and they repeat the suffering, uh, you know those people, they just tell everyone about their suffering. It becomes their rite of passage to do nothing in life. So it's their excuse. It's their excuse to not eat healthy, not go to the gym, not go on a new date, not try the new job, not start a new business. Whatever goals they have that, that scare them. Because goals are scary because it requires us to take action. And what does action do? It exposes us to failure. It exposes us to rejection. It exposes us to other people's criticism. So really suffering is a way for us to hide and do nothing. And we use that as the excuse to continue to do nothing. And it is the saddest thing to witness. And I see people living a nothing life or a really small life. And it's tragic because I see their brilliance. You know, I've always had a curiosity for other people's potential. And it really saddens me when I see someone living in the land of suffering that's completely self-inflicted. Okay, let's go back now to the first reason why some people cling to suffering. Well, as I said, it's attention. They seek attention. They crave the attention of their family, their friends, because they feel like if they replay their story or their suffering, 
to their friends and family, they'll feel sorry for them. But in, in reality, the opposite is true. I don't know about you, but I've had close friends who indulge in suffering. And after a while, I find I'm distancing myself from them, even though I love them and I used to enjoy their company. So if you are listening to this and you feel, yes, this could be me, I indulge in suffering to get the, the attention of people, just know that the attention is short-lived. Ultimately, people will get over it and move on. And you're going to be left alone with zero friends and family members who don't like to visit you. And that's the reality. I'm not here to sugarcoat anything, right? That's the cold hard truth. But look, don't stress. Let's now move on to the antidote. There is only one cure to suffering, and that is acceptance. Because the root cause of suffering is resistance, resistance to life's outcomes, resistance to the things you cannot control. Something bad has happened to you and you are resisting that and you are blaming and you are regretting and you are bitter about it. So the only way to neutralize those negative emotions that keep you below the line, the, below the baseline, uh, as I call it, is acceptance, right? Accepting whatever outcome life throws at you. I often say, do your best and let life do the rest. So what is acceptance? I know it's a word that gets thrown around a lot. And in my workshops, I go into a lot of detail on how to process and practice acceptance. But I'm going to give you a short summary for the purposes of this episode. Under my higher branch method, there are four steps to practicing acceptance. Now, when something bad happens to you, when you experience pain in your life, step one is to ask yourself, can I take action to reverse the damage? Whatever the damage is, if it's an injury, if it's a relationship, if it's a lost job, ask yourself, can I take action to reverse it? And in some cases, you can take action, right? If it's an injury, you can go to see a physio and get rehabilitated. You can do exercises. You can have an anti-inflammatory diet. You can sleep more. You can meditate and heal yourself. So step one is taking action. Step two, if you can't take action and you know that you can't reverse the pain, then ask yourself this beautiful question. What can I learn from this pain? It's a beautiful question because life is full of failures and experiences, but ultimately all the pain is learnings so we don't repeat the same mistakes. And I bet you're thinking of a lot of examples of something that has happened to you in the past that you, you can learn from. Maybe you did lose a job. What learning do you have from that? In my business, we always give people a debrief if they've lost their job and tell them what they did wrong so they can learn from it. Or if you failed in business, what did you learn from that failed business? Or you started an exercise routine and got injured. What did you learn from that so you don't repeat the, the injury again. So the second step is what did you learn? Step three is who do you need to forgive? This is a critical part of acceptance because a lot of the time when we are resisting, when we are blaming and therefore suffering, it is because we haven't forgiven, forgiven either ourselves or someone else. Forgiveness starts and ends with acknowledging that we are all imperfect on this earth, that we all make mistakes. So we need to stop holding ourselves and other people to an impossible standard. Now, I'm going to be recording a future episode on how to practice uh, forgiveness. And trust me when I say it is life changing. So stay tuned for that. OK, now let's turn to the fourth and final part of acceptance. And this is where I think the magic happens. And this is where you surrender completely to any outcome. This is where you trust. So if you can't take action to reverse something, if you can't learn from it, and if there is no one to forgive because it's a random act of the universe, then the fourth step is to trust that what has happened to you will either be good for you or for someone else in the future. This has happened to me so many times in life when where something that I initially considered as bad, it's been painful in the short term, either physically or emotionally, but I let it go and I trust that somehow, somewhere, sometime, this is going to be good for me in the future. Now, I, I want to stay on this last part because I think this is the hardest part for most people where they completely surrender uh, to the universe, right? They surrender to the outcome. Now, I'm going to give you a, a, cup, uh, a few examples of how a negative turned into a positive, how something that you considered was painful ended up being the best thing that ever happened to that person in life. So the first example I was, I'm going to give you is of a gentleman who lost his job. 
And after six months, he couldn't get uh, another job. It took him six months. Now, this is a few years back where we did a have a higher rate of unemployment. And for six months, after the six months, he actually slipped into depression. And uh, his friends visited him uh, often. And on one, one visit, uh, and, um, he, was, he was virtually living in his garage, right? Uh, in his parents' garage. And after one visit, one of his friends said, look, I bought a whole heap of uh, uh, big screen TVs for this particular construction job, but I have... Uh, uh, I don't have a need for them anymore. So anyway, uh, he said, well, uh, the gentleman I'm talking about said, I'll buy them from you. And he bought them and he proceeded to sell his big big screen TVs to uh, a lot of uh, family members and other friends. Anyway, it sparked an interest in him. Fast forward a few years, this same gentleman that I'm talking about now owns a multi-billion dollar online retailing company because... What When he lost his job, he felt like his life was over. But in fact, it was a beginning of a beautiful life because he started a new business on the back of that one incident where he just bought these six TVs and resold them and thought, I like doing this. I like buying stuff at wholesale and reselling it and making it a profit. Another example I want to give you is a relationship breakup uh, where one person you know, thought their life was over and went on to meet the partner of their dreams. And now they're now married with three children very happily. Now, at the time, uh, and this is a friend of mine, honestly, he was, was completely depressed about the breakup. And now when we look back on it, he said, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because deep down now, he, he realized that that relationship was uh, wrong for them. In this last example of where you need to trust the universe, and practice acceptance. This is a, a, an example that is very close to me, very personal to me, because my parents uh, left uh, Lebanon in the early 1970s because it was a war-torn country, it was civil war, and they left their property, their belongings, their jobs, everything behind. And they came to Australia. We were lucky enough to make it to Australia. I was only a little boy. Now, at that time, if you looked at what happened to them, there was nothing that they could take action to reverse that pain of having to leave your homeland. Nothing. Two, there was nothing that they could learn from it, right? It was beyond their control. Uh, three, there was no one to forgive, right? Because an act of war is general, right? There's no one to forgive. So they couldn't take action. They couldn't learn from it. And there was no one to forgive. But four... They trusted, my parents trusted that whatever happened to them would be good for them in the future because they came to another country and they rebuilt an incredible life. And in fact, it's on their shoulders that I built, built my life. It was their decision not to wallow in the pain and the misery of what happened to them, but to actually press on. My father had an incredible job back in Lebanon as a hotel manager. And he came to Australia and did three jobs. You know, he worked in factories by day and cleaned uh, office buildings and toilet, toilets and office buildings uh, by night. And I always remind myself of that example of how we should never, ever let pain define our future. Because what we think is bad in the short term could be the best thing that's ever happened to us. So you need to trust. If you can't take action, you can't learn from it, and there's no one to forgive, I urge you, don't resist the universe. Don't fight the universe. The universe will work in your favor if you just surrender to the outcome and accept what's, what's happened uh, uh, to you with complete abandon. Let it go. So that, my friends, is the antidote to suffering. It is acceptance in those four steps that I just described. Okay, so what if you practice that antidote and lift yourself out of suffering completely? How do you prevent yourself from slipping into that state in the future? And remember, why do we cling to suffering? It is because we either seek attention or it's an excuse for us to do nothing, a rite of passage, to not even, not even try, right? Now, I want to ask you this question, and the answer will lead you to the ultimate prevention of suffering. And the question is this. Do you think a founder of a new startup company indulges in suffering? Do you think an artist who's working on their next album indulges in suffering or an artist who is on tour with his or her band? 
Do you think it's the mother or father who has to look after their children that get them prepared for school, pack their lunches and read to them when they get home? Do you think they indulge in suffering? So what is the one thing that all these people have in common? It's life purpose. People with a life purpose don't have time for suffering. They deal with the pain and have to move on. It reminds me of something that David Goggins did a couple of years ago, which was completely inspiring. He injured his knee really, really badly, and he was getting injections, seeing doctors, and he was absolutely in a lot of pain. But do you think that stopped him from going to the gym? I remember he posted something on Instagram where he was walking on the treadmill, but instead of walking with his feet, with his legs, he was actually walking with his hands because he did not want to wallow in the land of regret and suffering. And a beautiful thing happens when we turn our back on suffering and get on and pursue our life purpose. What we take our attention away from slowly disintegrates, even the pain, even physical pain. Sometimes that's why they say time heals all, right? The other thing that people who have a purpose have in common is that they usually have others relying on them, their partner, their children, colleagues, clients, friends. I know that that I always show up to work for my team because I need to be there for my team. I don't have time to wallow in suffering. And that's why I always say that the ultimate purpose in life is to help others because we value ourselves in equal proportion to the value we add to others. Let me put it another way. When you pursue your goals in life, you have a purpose. And when those goals help all the people in your life, which is what they should, that gives you meaning. So on that note, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. In the next episode, I'm going to teach you how to find purpose and meaning in life so you never have to slip into a state of suffering. And so I hope today's episode has given you food for thought and apologies for confronting you with some really hard questions. As I said, we've all experienced pain and some of us have indulged in suffering. So if you really enjoyed this episode and know someone that could benefit from listening to this, please share it with them. And if you don't want to share it with them directly, because sometimes it can be uncomfortable, I get that, right? Just share it uh, publicly on Instagram or other social media and tag me in at Sam McCool. On Instagram, it's Sam McCool underscore AHB for a higher branch. Uh, Because ultimately, I want you to share this episode because... I'm on a mission to spread as many positive messages and as many practical techniques to help others. That's what drives me. And so don't forget to subscribe, leave a review. And if you're on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe, like, and leave me a a comment, even a question. Until then, always remember that every morning is the dawn of a new day and your chance to hit the reset button and climb higher in life. So I hope you have a great day. And until next time, as always, live consciously, my friends.